In this video lecture, we're going to demonstrate how you can use the thermal resistance method in an energy balance of a system. This problem states, a building owner wants to add a heated floor to his simple building. Ignoring windows, doors, and framing, the building walls and ceiling consist of a layer of insulation sandwiched between two layers of plywood. If the total floor area is 100 meters squared and the total wall and ceiling area is 500 meters squared, and those are combined, um, how much heat flux should the floor heater provide in the extreme conditions shown? And we're going to assume that this is at steady state. So what makes this an extreme condition? You'd want to design your heating system to be able to provide heat in the coldest time of the year. So we're using minus 10 degrees C to represent a pretty cold winter day. Um, we're given the thermal properties. So here we have the, in the insulation layer in yellow, and then we've got this uh, wood layer on either side of the insulation. We have this heated floor here on the bottom. Okay, and this is actually a pretty good practical problem. It's been greatly simplified, but you can see the value of knowing a lot about heat transfer if you are an architect or a, an energy engineer and, or, and you want to do some calculations for how do you conserve energy or how do you properly design a building. So I want to give you a minute to pause and think about how you might solve this problem. Okay, so I alluded to the fact that we might use an energy balance in this problem, and indeed, let's, let's think about this in terms of an energy balance. So when we're thinking about an energy balance, we have our accumulation in, out, and generation. Because the system is at steady state, we're going to assume zero. We're going to design uh, this heater system to, to maintain a steady state indoor temperature of 25 when the outdoor temperature is minus 10. Okay, in term. So we could treat this heated floor as an in term. We could treat it as a generation term, and that would sort of just depend on how we define our system boundaries. So in, if our system boundaries included the heated floor, um, then then we would treat this as a generation term. If our system boundaries were maybe just on the other side of the heated floor, then we might treat this as an in term because that energy's got to um, cross our system boundary to get in. And mathematically, either way, it'll be fine. So let's just treat it as an in term. So that in term would be, since we're given a flux, or we're asked to find the flux, we'd have Q floor times the area of the floor. Okay, and let's just say there's zero generation since we treated the heated floor as an in. All right, so our out term now is where this gets a little bit tricky. So unlike uh, in previous problems where our rate terms are typically either like a, a flux or a known energy rate, or we use the three different rate laws that we've learned to this point, the out term is gonna be much more complicated because we have heat here. That heat is going to convect to this inner wall then it's got to conduct in series through these three solid layers, and then it's going to convect again outside. So I do want to point out that even though this is a building, we are going to pretty much treat it as a plain wall system. So in effect, we're going to be ignoring these corners, what's happening at the corners, and this drawing obviously isn't to scale and treat each individual wall and the ceiling as a plain wall. Okay, so how do we go about capturing the rate of energy leaving this building. So as you've learned in the previous few lectures, there's this thermal resistance method which can come in really handy. And actually, we can just write our outlaw in very simple terms. We can say that it is equal to Ti, or the indoor air temperature, minus To, or the outdoor air temperature, divided by the total thermal resistance. And so now it just comes down to how do we quantify that total thermal resistance? So let's think about how we would do that. So we have five different uh, layers of thermal resistance. So they're all going to be in series. Heat is going to be traveling in series from inside through those three layers and then to outside. So we can get that our, our total is just equal to the sum of all of our individual thermal resistances. And then it just becomes a matter of calculating what those thermal resistances are. So let's go ahead and do that. So we have our R total 
First we have the indoor convective thermal resistance. So a convective thermal resistance is given by 1 over H times A. And because this is indoor, we're going to use our indoor um, convective heat transfer coefficient. This is multiplied by the total area of the walls and ceilings. I'm just going to call that A wall. Okay, so now we have our three conductive thermal resistances, and we can use this table from the book, table 3.3. So here we're dealing with a plane wall system. We can just look up what's the thermal resistance for that plane wall system. And it is L, or the wall thickness, divided by K, which is the wall's thermal conductivity, times A, which is the total surface area of the wall. So for the inner wood layer, we would have the thickness of the wood divided by the thermal conductivity of the wood times the wall area. And notice these two areas are the same because we're treating it as just a plain wall system and ignoring those corners. All right, then we've got the insulation layer, L insulation, divided by thermal conductivity of the insulation and the area of the wall. Then we've got the other wood layer, and for simplicity in this problem, these are just the same type of material and the same thickness. Obviously a real building you might use different types of materials, but it's just a matter of summing up, summing them up with the proper thermal properties. And then finally we have that outer, outer convection layer, which has the thermal resistance of 1 over H times A, but specifically we need to use that outer convection coefficient. Okay, so that's how we get our total thermal resistance. So if we could sum these up, so I've taken the liberty, if you notice, uh, we have the different thermal properties here. Notice that the insulation is thicker. You want it to be thicker because you want that uh, thermal resistance. So that L gives you increased thermal resistance. And then for insulation, you want something that has a low thermal conductivity. So this certainly is a pretty low thermal conductivity. If we compare that to the wood, the wood is thinner because it's there more for structure rather than insulation. And then it's got this uh, higher thermal conductivity. So just kind of note those numbers when we compare how much each of these contributes to the total thermal resistance. So I've calculated these offline and I just want to show them to you here. So for each of these thermal resistances, we have them listed here. We have um, summed up what the resistance value is and that has units of Kelvin per watt, and it gets a little tricky with the decimal points. So you can notice that the insulation has by far the highest value here. And if we were to sum them all up and divide by the total, we see that that insulation layer provides 82% of the thermal resistance. Whereas convection, so those are reasonably high convection coefficients. So there's not much thermal resistance. You expect a very small delta T, um, between the air layers and the surface temperatures because um, there's very little thermal resistance. So there wouldn't be much difference between the indoor air temperature and the indoor wall temperature, and same for the outdoor temperature. So it seems like that insulation is doing a pretty good job, relatively speaking, of keeping this building insulated. So if we took all these numbers, which again we're just plug and chug using the 1 over HA for the convection and then L over KA for the conduction. We can take those up and substitute them all into here and we ended up with a total thermal resistance of 0 0.004069 Kelvin per watt. So back to our energy balance, when we compiled our energy balance, so let's go here, we get that accumulation equals in, which is that Q double dot floor times the oh, floor area. I hope I said floor area, yep. <laughs> Minus our out term which is just going to be Ti minus To divided by the sum of our five thermal resistances, which we can just do separately. So now it's just a matter of solving 
for what the design parameter that we want. So we want to know how powerful of floor heaters do we need. So we get that Q floor is equal to Ti minus To divided by R total. And then we would also pick up this A floor in the denominator. So doing the math, again, I did this offline, but we end up needing a floor heating system that can provide a flux of 86 watts per square meter. We can see the value of this thermal resistance method. You can see the value of just knowing about heat transfer to solve practical design and energy saving problems. So we solved a problem where we were trying to figure out how powerful to make that floor heater so that we could maintain this certain temperature. But you could also use this to figure out, uh, for example, okay, how much, if I added a different type of insulation or if I added more insulation, could I make that smaller? Could I save some energy? Or you could look at what the effects of um, doors and windows might be. So a lot of really useful things you can do with this methodology.